Greetings and blessings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Happy Resurrection Day. He is risen, and of course we answer back with what? Yes, we have to do that. Why? Because we're affirming today one of the most precious truths that the Bible talks about. And today we are going to have a lot of Scripture. Are we okay with that this morning? I was really praying, and, and as fun as it would be to get into the brood of vipers speech again with John the Baptist, I thought, you know what? We need to have today a reflection on the resurrection. And the only source material that we need to worry about today is the Holy Word of God. And I think it will stand in distinction to what Easter has become, and I use the word Easter as the world uses it. I'm not going to say that word hereafter today because this has nothing to do with bunnies, eggs, or the goddess Ishtar. All right? That's nonsense. This is not a holiday in which we, you know, we eat too many Cadbury cream eggs and, and you know, go and feast and do all of this in the name of some, uh, some American sentiment or nostalgia. This is about the resurrection of Jesus. But here's what I want to say hereafter as well. Every day is resurrection day for the believer. Amen? Because Christ is risen indeed. You can go to Muhammad's tomb in Medina. Well, you can't, but a lot of people can. They know where it is. They know where Gautama Buddha is buried. They know where great Hindu sages and, and, and Muslim scholars and all kinds of cult leaders and other religious people, in fact, every human being uh, that we know about, their bones are in the ground never to arise until the last day. And we'll talk about the resurrection that is facing every person. But Jesus, you will not find his body or his bones. Amen? He is risen, and that is the truth that we celebrate today because if that wasn't true, we wouldn't even need to be here. But he really died, first of all. He did not survive the cross on Good Friday. He gave up his life for us. He was laid in a tomb, and we all affirm these things. And he rose again Sunday morning as he burst forth from the grave, just like we just sang about. Because the grave had no power over him. Death could not hold him. And I rejoice because my Savior is alive. And because he lives, I will live also. How about you? Amen? Let's get excited this morning about the passages that we're going to read. Turn with me in the Tanakh, the Old Testament. <clears throat> before 2100 B.C., perhaps way before, the book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible in terms of its origin. The life of Job, so marked with pain and suffering, but also great faith. After all, it was Job who said, though he slays me, still I will trust in him. Let us look at the passage, Job 19, verses 23 through 27. Extremely powerful words, full of faith, full of expectancy. And it's the type of belief and trust we ought to have in our Savior. Job says these words, Job 19, verse 23 through 27. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. And that with an iron stylus and, and lead, that they were engraved in the rock forever. As for me, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God whom I myself shall behold, and whom mine, uh, my eyes will see, and not another, my heart, he says, faints within me. Here we have an early statement of faith in a resurrection. Job not only acknowledges that his Redeemer lives, but he will live and stand on the last day, but he will stand with him. He will see him even after he passes away. This is the power of resurrection being spoken about. Let us fast forward. Quite a few hundred years to 863 B.C. in the book of 1 Kings. <clears throat> I warned you, we're going to go to a lot of Scripture. So go to 1 Kings chapter 17 for a moment. I thought as I was praying about this, let's look and focus on the Old Testament first uh, of examples of resurrection. And here's this great story, albeit with a few quirks in it, which I think just make it so interesting. It is in the ministry of Eliyahu Hanabi, Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite, 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 1 Kings 17, verse 17 through 24 says, 
It came about after these things that the son of the woman, this is the woman, the widow of Zarephath, the mistress of the house became sick, and his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. In other words, what? He died. Amen? So she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. And he said to her, Give me your son. Then he took him from her bosom and carried him up to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. He called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? And then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the life of the child returned to him and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Praise God for that story. Isn't that great? Resurrection. The joy, the elation that, uh, that his mom must have felt. as She now has her son returned. But notice again, what does Elijah acknowledge? God is in control of life and death. And God granted this power of resurrection in this case. Go with me to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. This is the story now of Elijah's disciple, Elisha. This is in 863, this is in 849 B.C., so about 20 years later. And a Shunammite woman loses her son. Look at verses 32 to 37. When Elisha came into the house, behold, the lad was dead and laid on his bed. So he entered and shut the door behind them both and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself on him and the flesh of the child became warm. Folks, Quirky, kind of strange, but a divine miracle. His life being restored to him. Verse 35, he returned and walked in the house once back and forth, went up and stretched himself on him again, and the lad sneezed seven times, and the lad opened his eyes. I love it. He called Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her, and when she came into him, he said, take up your son. She went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground, and she took up her son and went out. Again, great elation, great joy, kind of strange. But who restored life? Oh, well, it was the body heat of Elijah. That, no, it was God giving back life to this dead person. Only God can do that, and we celebrate that this morning. One final episode in 2 Kings. Go to 2 Kings 13. Here's why we're reading these today, because, you know, in a lot of churches, the scriptures will not be central and focused this morning, even about this holiday. Yes, the resurrection will be mentioned, and I praise God, even here in Columbus, there are many places that are upholding the word of God and teaching on the resurrection, and I'm sure that's true worldwide. But there's also a lot of apostasy in the church, and we do well to celebrate today with absolute abandon, if you will, the joy that we get from God's word about resurrection. Here's another cool story. 2 Kings 13, verses 20 to 21. Elisha died and they buried him. Now the bands of the Moabites would invade the land in the spring of the year. And as they were burying a man, in other words, they're throwing him into this, uh, this uh, burial cave or this area where Elisha's uh, body was. Behold, they saw a marauding band and they cast the man into the grave of Elisha. And when the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Anybody ever hear that story? That's resurrection power, buddy. God using the bones of Elisha. Now, none of us need to go out and start grave soaking or frequenting cemeteries to get the anointing from dead people like Benny Hinn and Bethel and all of these people. That's not the point of the story. The point is, God used Elisha's bones for yet another testimony of resurrection. Check this out. Every time we read about a resurrection in the Old Testament, every time we read the words of Job here, and as we fast forward to 725 B.C., go with me to Isaiah 26, 
every time we read anything about God restoring life. And we're not talking about mere resuscitation. We are talking about returning one's soul and spirit to their lifeless corpse. There's a lot of cases today, and I saw an interview this week of a gentleman who believes that he was clinically dead and you know above his body and having a near-death experience and all of this. Listen, this is not about that. This is about someone who is completely absent from the shell that they have been given in this life, in this body. They have underwent decay. Their body immediately... We're, we're, we're decaying right now. Anybody know that this morning? I don't care how good you look. You're experiencing massive cellular death right now because we're under the curse and in the fall. But praise God, our life isn't centered around this world, which is passing away. It's rooted in eternity because Jesus has given us eternal life, and we will ever be with the Lord, and we will get a glorified body, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Go to Isaiah 26, 19. Listen to this. Every time we hear about resurrection in the Old Testament, it points forward to the ultimate resurrection that we are celebrating today, which is Jesus our Lord. Keep that in mind. The Zarephath woman's son, the Shunammite woman's son, Elisha's bones bringing life back to somebody. Anytime here, look at, look at Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead will live. Their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy, for your dew is as the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. Now this is promised in Israel's kingdom song. There's a huge context to this. We don't have time to go through that, but what's the very clear promise here to Israel that there is a resurrection? There will be the return of those who have passed away. Go with me to a glorious passage in Isaiah. They're all glorious, we know that. But go to Isaiah 53. All right, am I going too fast this morning? Okay, because I, I need to go faster, but I won't. We're going we're, we're to do this. I believe the Lord will honor the reading of his word with as minimal commentary from me as possible. <sighs> Folks, the gospel is so important. Good Friday happened before Resurrection Sunday, and it had to. Jesus had to die. And Jesus really did die. And he allowed sinful man to beat, scorn, mock, spit on, persecute, whip, torment, and eventually nail him to a cross, but he gave up his life. Amen? But not before shedding blood on our behalf. You understand, this is the gospel this morning. If you're watching this, resurrection is the capstone to Christianity. Without resurrection, it's all a big failure. But it wasn't because it ended in in, in resurrection life, but Jesus finished the work on the cross as the Father was pleased to crush Him for our sins and iniquities. Nothing Jesus did warranted Him deserving to die the scandalous, horrendously painful, hard-to-look-at death that He died. But it was a beautiful thing that He did on our behalf. If you're listening this morning and you don't know Jesus... You've got, to, you've got to take some time today to reflect on, you know, if this is true, Jesus really did show ultimate love for me because we're his enemies. We're sinners. We are not worth the dust that we're made of apart from Christ. And if you're here this morning or you're watching this morning and you don't know Jesus, he died for the sins of the whole world, the Bible says, but the world's got to turn and repent and receive that sacrifice on their behalf. Now we know many or most won't, but if you're here this morning or you're on watching and the Holy Spirit's wrestling your heart, you need to drop to your knees and ask forgiveness for your sins and believe in the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. But it's not all blood and gore and a bloody end for some great prophet or some founder of a religion. We know that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh we know that he was the ultimate sacrifice. And it says here, verse 10 of Isaiah 53, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. 
If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and he will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. That's God will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Folks, that is the gospel of what Jesus did on Calvary for us. And praise God, his days were prolonged and he did not see corruption or decay as Mike read in that passage this morning. And up from the grave, he arose. Amen? But all of these, foreshadow this glorious event. For another reference, Daniel 12, verses 1 through 3. This is about the fact that everyone will be resurrected at some point. And folks, how many of you know you're going to live forever? Amen? I don't care who you are, unbeliever or believer, you're going to live forever. The question is where? The question is with whom? The question is in whose presence? Are you going to dwell eternally? And I promise you, you want it to be God. You don't want the fiery separation and torment of a place called hell that was created for Satan and his angels. But nonetheless, it's the only place that you'll be consigned to if you don't believe in Jesus. If you don't trust in the fact that he resurrected, that he died and was buried and was resurrected and purchased our salvation. Daniel 12, verse 1 through 3. At the time of the end, it says, Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Which one do you want to be? Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. Those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, he's supposed to then conceal the words and seal up the book. Listen, the resurrection of the dead is coming. And I promise you, you want to have known Jesus Christ in this life so that you can awake to glory and everlasting life. Amen? I'd like to call Dale Purdy forward here this morning. We've got a number of uh, folks that are going to lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving for the passages that we have just read. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the examples that Pastor Steve just read about resurrection, all of these happening before your resurrection. We ask that... Your word will not go forth from here void. We ask that it would, these, these scripture readings would be remembered and permeate our hearts. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let's go to the New Testament this morning. Our Lord and Savior Yeshua affirms that there will be a resurrection. John chapter 5. We will go through these passages very quickly, but I think the truth is very simple and self-evident this morning. And my exhortation is that we know that we know that we belong to Jesus today. John chapter 5, verses 28 through 29 Again, there are many contexts in this that we will get to when we get there. But Jesus says, starting in verse 25, actually, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming, Jesus says, in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice 
and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Can it be any clearer, folks? Well, I'm not sure what he was getting at there. Yes, we are. It was vivid, wasn't it? He's confirming exactly what God told Daniel, isn't he? Go with me to the next chapter, John chapter 6. Verse 39 through 40. Anybody's fingers getting tired of pages yet? Hang in there. It's going to get a... You're going to work up an appetite for lunch today. No, just joking. I love it that we can uh, look into God's Word this morning. <clears throat> Chapter 6, verse 39 through 40 says, This is the will of Him who sent me, that of all that He has given me, I lose nothing, but, Jesus says, He will raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself, Jesus says, will raise him up on the last day. Verse 44 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Is it clear? Jesus will resurrect those who come to him on the last day. Praise God. There's not eternal life in anybody else. There is no system that you can follow. There is no religion that you can join. There is no group of people who mean well that are going to get you salvifically into heaven or into eternal life. You will not receive resurrection power unto glory and to righteousness, by the way, unless you come to the Son. And by the way, you don't want to be resurrected to shame and everlasting contempt with the Son as your judge. Amen? A warning there and a reminder. There's a number of miracles, obviously, that Jesus does resurrection in. I'm going to just read you the reference to two of them. Jairus' daughter, Matthew 9, verse 23 through 29. And the widow's only son, Luke 7, verses 11 through 15. But go with me to John chapter 11. The most famous picture, I think, that most people think of immediately when they talk about resurrection and a dynamic miracle that Christ did. And that is Lazarus of Bethany. I'm not going to read the whole story to you. We know the context. He lingered so that Lazarus could die. For what purpose? To display the glorious power of resurrection. To show. This is so wonderful. Starting in verse 17 of John 11. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother, Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And here's my question to you this morning. Do you believe this? Amen? Yes. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. And we know the story, Lazarus, come forth. And he hops out because he was bound uh, hand and foot, probably. And Jesus says, what? Unwrap him and let him go. And there he is. Wonderful, beautiful, prefiguring miracle of resurrection because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. There is no other hope. At the death of Christ, you don't need to turn here, but Matthew 28, verse 51 through 54, graves opened and uh, formerly dead folks were seen walking around Jerusalem. Isn't that great? Could you imagine? That's what happened. That's the power that surrounded the death of Jesus, and it was, it was shown and manifested in a resurrection of many saints around Jerusalem. Well, go with me to Luke 24. There are all the gospel accounts of the resurrection of Jesus, but we're just going to read Luke's account. Verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, 
they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but what? He has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. They remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James. Also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles, but these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only and he went away to his home marveling at what had happened. Folks, we know the rest of the story. Read the other accounts in the synoptics and in the book of John. And you will, again, celebrate afresh the excitement that must have been theirs that morning and the fear and the trepidation and the disbelief and the lack of faith. Because after all, how many of us are used to seeing resurrection? How many of us are used to being told, even though Jesus said and promised over and over, we know that they just didn't get it, but here's the deal. He was crucified, he was buried, and he really did rise again, and you cannot go to Jesus' tomb today. Or you might be able to go to the tomb where they think he would have laid, but he's not there, and we don't have his bones in a bone box. I don't care what the liberals and other people say. They found Jesus and his wife's, you know, the family grave and all this nonsense. He's not there. He's risen. And he's coming back. I'm excited about that this morning. You don't need to turn here, but I'm going to read this to you. By God's power, Peter says in Acts 2.24, God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Romans 8.11 says, The Spirit who raised Christ from the dead, it better dwell in you or you are not his. But the Spirit raised Christ from the dead. Christ himself said in John 2.19, destroy this temple, and of course he meant his body, and in three days I will raise it up again. And he said in John 10.18, that I lay my own life down and I take it up again. What am I telling you this morning? The Trinity was involved in the resurrection of Jesus. Brother David Fox, would you come forward please and share with us a prayer of thanksgiving? Join me in prayer, please. Abba, thank you so much for this plan, for what you did, for sending your son out of this unimaginable love. Thank you, Jesus, for humbling yourself and taking my sin and our sins upon yourself. I pray that we will always be repentant and reminded of what you did for us. And thank you, thank you, God, for raising from the dead. God, we are humbled by what you have done and so thankful that at the last day you are going to raise us up as well, that we will get to be in your family. Thank you for adopting us, God. God, I love you. We love you. I pray that just as you, Jesus, prayed, just as you prayed, that we will all be unified, that we will be as one in mind and heart and spirit, just as you are with the Father. And I pray that we will just carry this with us always, and we will always keep it in our minds at the forefront of everything that we do and think, and help us to continue to bear fruit in keeping with the Spirit. Prune every branch that does not bear fruit, but make us constantly displaying your love and peace and joy. Remind us that we are righteous, made righteous by you. We thank you, God. Keep us humble. Bless us and keep us. And protect us and help us to stand firm. Amen. For our next segment, I couldn't stop. Kept going through the New Testament, kept going through the, the scriptures, the letters. 
And I found about 40 verses or so, maybe 35 to 40 verses, about the evidence of the resurrection from within Scripture. I call it the body of evidence, the scriptural support that the resurrection really happened. And by faith, we receive those things. And we are not going to go through 40 verses in this next section. We have more to get to after that. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to summarize for you this. If you would like the list of the verses, please come with me after, come to me after, and I will email it to you this afternoon. Or you can watch it on YouTube, which it will be scrolling along the bottom. Uh, it, it, it's a lot, but here's the summary of the body of evidence. It was proven by the empty tomb, the resurrection was, by angelic testimony, by the testimony of his enemies. John 20 says there were, quote, many infallible proofs of his resurrection. The apostles preaching in the book of Acts, and there are many examples of that. The Lord's Day being the first of the week. That's also a testimony to the resurrection. Post-resurrection appearances like that to Mary Magdalene, to the other women, to two disciples in Luke 24, to Simon Peter, to the apostles, and then to 11 of them in two separate instances in the book of John, to the apostles at the Sea of Tiberias, to the apostles in Galilee, to 500 at once, over 500 brethren at once, to all of the apostles, it says in Luke 24, to Paul, and to James. Post-resurrection appearances. Taking all of those into account, I promise you, it is an exciting and glorious study of resurrection and the fact that it is backed up by the testimony of those who saw Christ after He rose again from the dead. Look it up. You will be blessed. Go with me to Acts chapter 1. We're nearing the end of our time today, but we do have a few more moments, so please stick with me here. Acts chapter 1. Verse 3, after it says that he, he had given by the Holy Spirit orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to these it says he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there for that intense month and 10 days of teaching before the ascension? I promise you that would have been enriching. Look at verse 22 of Acts chapter 1. Verse 22 says, Beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And again, this is the conversation about who was going to take Judas' place. But it had to be based on the fact that they had witnessed his resurrection. Go with me to Peter's second sermon in Acts chapter 3. Just a few statements that ought to ring in our hearts this morning about how convinced these men, actually in Acts 2 first, I'm sorry. Go to Acts 2, verses 29 through 33. <clears throat> this is on the day of Pentecost. And Peter says these following power-packed words. Brethren, I may confidently, confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried. And his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. What an awesome testimony. Verse 40 and 41 of the same passage. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day were added to him about 3,000 souls. Folks, I want to urge you, if you're listening here today or online, be saved from this perverse generation. Turn to the risen Christ. He is your only hope. Acts 3, verse 13 through 15. Peter's second sermon on Solomon's porch. <clears throat> the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. 
And on the basis of faith in his name, it is in the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. This is the man that Peter healed. Finally, Acts 4.33. And I'm going to go ahead and ask our brother Mike to come forward and pray right after I read verse 33 of Acts chapter 4. And there are many more verses we could look at but it says, with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. In Acts 17, verse 16 through 18, and 31 through 34, Paul talks about the resurrection of Jesus as the basis for the judgment of the unbelieving world. If you don't believe in the resurrection, then you're in big trouble with God. Amen? Go ahead and pray for us. Brother. Pray together. <clears throat> Father in heaven, as we look at these passages in Scripture and we were reminded of the central fact of human history, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Father, our hearts are ignited with the, the truth and the knowledge that it's only through Jesus Christ that people's sins are forgiven. Father, the book of Acts records that by the Holy Spirit's power, the early followers of Jesus Christ were witnesses to his resurrection. Father, I pray for FBC. I pray for every believer watching this message. Father, I pray that we might become witnesses to the resurrection and that we might share the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection calling on people to repent of their sin, to turn from their sin, and to believe by faith in Jesus Christ. Father, help us to do that until his return, and help us to share with whoever has ears to hear. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In closing here this morning, as we're uh, almost out of time together, on this wonderful Resurrection Sunday, Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to read two portions from the writings of Paul. The climax of which is going to be 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to read a portion of that because that's probably the best or, or, or the most concise, uh, not concise, but specific treatise on resurrection. And I urge you to make that a point of study this week as you think about the glorious event that we're celebrating today. But in Philippians 3, verses 7 through 10, Paul talks about the goal of his life. He says, Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, he says, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish or dung, so that I may gain Christ. Ask yourself, first of all, is that your attitude in life? Are you willing to take all the accolades of men, all of your accomplishments, all of your good reputation, all of anything that you've ever worked hard to earn for, all of the victories that you've ever experienced, all of the lessons that you've learned even in your defeats, all of the things that make you feel really good about yourself or that the world says is important for your status and for your, for your positions in this life in the pecking order? Are you willing to take it all and say it is a pile of scubula? That's the Greek word for dung. That's what it is. Compared to what? Knowing Christ. My friends, if you haven't gained Christ, you've lost it all. If you die without gaining Christ, nothing matters. It was a waste. And it's literally waste when you compare it to the glories of knowing Jesus. Amen? How many of you all had a bad week? I'm not going to get Joel Osteen on you and tell you, you know, well, let's make it better with a smile. No. Some of us have had horrendous weeks. And you know what? My heart goes out to John this morning who lost his mom this week. But he didn't lose her. Amen? She's in the presence of the risen Savior whom she loved and who she gained. But the rest of us have got to live down here and deal with some stuff. And some of us are going through some really big, insurmountable in human terms problems. And I promise you, though, it's not worth stress and pain and anguish 
but that's all you got if you don't have Jesus this morning. And I'm so thankful that we as believers can say therein is our strength. His goal continues. Verse 9, he says, I want to be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Folks, doesn't that put everything in perspective? That's why he can go on to write, I'm forgetting all that stuff which is behind, and I'm pressing forward, man. I am looking forward to the day when we are delivered from these bodies of death. When we, because of what Christ has done, will experience eternal life and peace and shalom and this this, this awesome, never-ending, sinless, perfection experience with Jesus. Are you ready? Are you hungry? Are you not groaning along with all creation for this to happen? Are you not this morning finding that Jesus Christ is more important than anything, any joy, again, any accomplishment, any relationship you have on this earth, I promise you the one with Jesus is the crucial, we'll use a word that was taken from crucifixion, it's crucial to your eternal life. And Paul recognized that's what's worth striving for in the strength that God provides. 1 Corinthians 15. Brother Bill read a portion of it this morning for the Scriptures. I'd like to reread that portion and just read a lengthier chunk here of 1 Corinthians 15. And then we've got one or two other places to go and we will close. But I'm going to have Brother Bill come up here in a moment and uh, lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving for this section. Again, Paul's treatise on the fact of Christ's resurrection. Let me tell you, this guy was convinced that Jesus rose again. So were all of the apostles because they all met death and persecution in some way. John dying a natural death, but not after being, you know, attempted to boil him in oil and being exiled to Patmos. Something happened to these men where they were convinced that the one-to-one correspondence was there. The body they put in the tomb was the body that appeared to them afterwards restored and glorified. And they went forth mightily and died because they knew Jesus had risen. Listen closely, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, Paul says, which you also received, in which also you stand by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. It's a warning. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Amen? This morning has been about according to the Scriptures. And that He appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. But in other words, go ask them. There's people in that number that saw the risen Christ, Paul says. Verse 7, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, Paul says, he appeared to me also. For I'm the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached. And so you believed. Now if Christ is preached that He had been raised from the dead, then how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? What a question. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, beloved, this morning, then our preaching, Paul says to them, is vain. Your faith is also useless or vain. Moreover, he says, we are even found to be false witnesses of God. We're liars because we testified against God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if, in fact, the dead are not raised. I love his argumentation here. Amen? Excited about this? Verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, man, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. 
You're still in your sins. And that, that's frightening. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ, well, they perish too. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Folks, you missed the boat of partying if Jesus didn't rise. You missed the boat of hedonism and living like it's your last day on earth because it did, nothing else matters. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you die unless Christ was raised. But now, verse 20, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. Let me hear an amen if you believe this. Amen. For since by a man came death, well, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. If you trust Jesus, you will be made alive. Amen. We're all born under the sentence of the death of sin the mastery of sin. We're slaves to, to sin and Satan. He's our Father until we believe in Jesus Christ who rose from the dead. Amen? We're transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. We are put into the kingdom of, of light. We are, put in, we, we are given eternal life and a rewritten eternity, a rewritten destiny because Jesus rose again. And nobody else has been able to do that. Brother Bill Fairfield, will you come up For a prayer of thanksgiving. <clears throat> Father, this portion of your word is proof of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Amen. In this short portion of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he recaps the fullness of the good news of the gospel that Jesus died, he was buried. And after three days in victory over the grave, he arose. He didn't rise and leave the earth. He stayed for a while. He appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, to more than 500 believers, and even to the apostle Paul himself. When we pray to accept Jesus' free gift of salvation, he then appears to us also by coming into our hearts. Only after showing himself to hundreds, and hundreds of individuals did Jesus ascend to heaven to sit at your right hand, having completed his mission to provide a way for us to have a relationship with you. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son. Thank you, Jesus, for your obedience and for drinking from the cup of our sins. Your blood made atonement for our filthy sins, and it's only through Jesus that we can be saved. Amen. As we close here, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Messages to the seven churches here, or the message, is from Jesus Christ, verse 5 says, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's how he introduces himself there, or how he's introduced. And then look at verse 18. Jesus says in verse 17, Do not be afraid, I'm the first and the last. This is after John falls like a dead man at the risen Christ's feet. Verse 18, Jesus says, I'm the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys to death and of Hades, the grave. Who do you want to trust today? Who are you trusting I'm going to trust in a risen Savior who says, I was dead, but I am alive forevermore. In John 14, 19, Jesus promised His disciples, because I live, you shall live also. Folks, treasure this certainty in your hearts today. Take this with you. Ask the Lord to help you in your unbelief at times when life just looms so large that we go throughout a day not thinking about the resurrection. Anybody done that? Some days I find a right about lunch. I'm like, oh yeah, uh, Jesus. Let it not be said of us anymore that we would go forth on fire as saints of the living God who serve a living Savior 
and who have eternal life awaiting us, not because of our righteousness or goodness, but because of Christ's righteousness that has been given to all who have embraced Him as their living, risen Lord and Savior. Romans 10.9 says, right? If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. There's the invitation. There's the commission. And let's ask God for strength and certainty in these last days. Amen? He is risen. Father, thank you this morning for this time of prayer and reflection. Lord, I know these passages were uh, lengthy and we went through them very quickly and there's context to all of it that we do well to learn and understand, to make a part of our daily bread as we read your word. Father, we need to be serious in these last days that we are standing on a faith that is founded on fact on a faith that has, here's the proof for the resurrection. And we need to be able to manifest in our lives with the strength of God that He provides this glorious new life that we've been given. We need to live like Christ. We need to minister to others like Jesus would have us do so. And we need to ever point people to the death, burial, and resurrection. And the certainty that because He lives, We will live also, and He is coming back because He is the living King. He will rule and reign, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. And Father, we thank You for the gift of Your Son, and we thank You for the gift of eternal life that is ours because Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. Thank You, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.